welcome. So in the last lecture, we were discussing, uh, rather recalling uh, the concept of Riemann integration and let us have a quick review of what we did in the last lecture is that if f is a bounded function defined on a b to r, then we are first we are taking a partition of a b as uh, a is equal to x 1 less than x 2, this is less than x n which is equal to b and then we define the Riemann sum f with a corresponding partition p is equal to summation over f of c i and delta of x i and i from 1 to uh, n minus 1 and c i is nothing but uh, this belongs to any point on x i or x i plus 1 and then we define the norm of p is the maximum of delta x i and 1 less or equal to i less or equal to n minus 1 and then we define the integral a to b if the limit exists, if this limit exists, then we say that f is Riemann integrable and the integration of f is this. Okay. So, now let us look at the very standard properties of uh, Riemann integration that we know that it is, uh, uh, it is integral is linear. That means, if we take alpha f plus beta g and we integrate, then you can pull out alpha from the integral and then it will be alpha times a to b f of x dx beta times a to b g of x dx for all alpha beta in r. And uh, now, if we have a to b and then c is a point there, then we can calculate the integral a to c f of x dx and c to b f of x dx. If we add them, then we are going to get the integral from a to b. So, that is uh, also trivial. Uh, because uh, the partition of A to C union the partition of C to B, it is a disjoint partition, so we can take their sum. Monotonicity, if f of x is less or equal to g of x, then f x integral of our f of x dx is less or equal to g x dx, that is no, we know. Then this is important is that one of the most important thing which the Riemann integration tells that actually the integral what we have learned uh, in high school that it is antiderivative, it is the same as the way we are defining the Riemann integration. So, what does it say is that uh, in high school remember that we have defined the integration as an antiderivative and exactly this is what it relates that this prescription of Riemann, it is going to, if you do perform the integral, this is nothing but the antiderivative if you have a nice function. So, now if f is continuous and integral and capital of f of x is a to x f t dt, then f prime of x is equal to f of x. That is uh, the antiderivative part which is saying that uh, this f prime derivative of the integral is nothing but the function itself. And uh, then there is another part of fundamental theorem of calculus that is the evaluation part and that it says that suppose you are doing with the f prime is Riemann integrable, f, you are starting work with f is a function which is differentiable, then f prime is Riemann integrable. It is not necessarily that if I take a function f, which is a differentiable function, then the f prime is going to be differentiable or not is not known to me. At this stage, we need, which in fact will not be true, we need to impose the condition that f prime is Riemann integrable. Then uh, a to b f prime of x dx equal to f b minus f a that is the evaluation part. 
Okay, so this uh, is the standard stuff of Riemann integration. So one of the flaws in the Riemann in theory of the Riemann integration that it it is not very well behaved with respect to convergence of sequence of functions. One would like to ask: suppose we have re sequence of Riemann integrable functions, and f f n x converges to f of x for each x. Will it be true that f n x integral a to b converges the integral a to b f of x dx? If f n converges to f, does it imply that integral of f n converges to integral of f? So, which may not be true, you take the function for example, f n x is n 0 to n. So, now let us f 1 is this, f 2 is here is 1, 1 by 2 and then this is 1, then f 2 is up to half, this is 2 and from half to 1, this is 0. Similarly, f 3 you can define if it is your 1 by 3, then here it is taking the value 3, then 0 here up to 1. So, now where does this function converge? Now, I take a x in 0 1. Now, wherever the x is, however, does not matter however close it is to 0, I can always get a n such that 1 by n is less than x. Now, if I suppose this is my 1 by n sub naught. Now, any n bigger than n sub naught, 1 by n is going to be less than 1 by n sub naught. Therefore, all this 1 by n will like over here. Now, for this x, f n of x is equal to 0 for all n greater or equal to this n naught. Therefore, this function f n is now converging where? It is converging to the 0 function. Okay. Now, if I take the integral from 0 to 1 f n x. So, this is going to be n into 0 to 1 by n d x, which is equal to n into 1 by n, which is equal to 1. And now, the integral of the 0 function, because f of x is 0 here, therefore, 0 to 1 0 d x, this is equal to 0 and this is 1, which does not convert. So, Riemann integration in principle does not really respect the point wise convergence. However, if, if f n converges to f uniformly, then we have got, got the result that a to b f n x d x converges to integral a to b f of x d x. So, just the point wise convergence does not give us the required result. Okay. So, now the series f n x converges uniformly to f of x, then f is Riemann integrable and a to b summation n from 1 to infinity f n x d x, we can interchange the limit and the sum. Because what is this? The summation of n equal to 1 to infinity f n of x, this is actually limit of n goes to infinity summation n from 1 to n f n of x. This you can call it as s n of x. So, now this is what we are interchanging is that here it the convergence is uniform therefore the limit can be interchanged with the integral this essentially is saying what limit 
of n goes to infinity a to b f n x d x is equal to a to b limit n goes to infinity f n x d x. That is what the meaning of this statement is. So, we can interchange the limit and integral if we have uniform convergence with us. So, that is an easy consequence that the sum is nothing but the limit of some partial sum then the by the linearity. So, here what you have got a to b this is limit of S n which is I know that this is uniformly convergent. So, I pull out the limit I have a to b S n. Now, this S n is nothing but the finite sum. So, by linearity of the Riemann integral, now we can interchange this finite sum with the integral, then what we get is the appropriate result over here. Okay, so, so far so good. Now, what we have seen in the first lecture that uh, we asked ourselves the question, uh, what Fourier claimed that given any 2 pi periodic function, we can have a representation of that function through cosine and sine. That is e to the power, it can be represented in form of the Fourier series. So, before addressing that problem, so let us uh, make ourselves little familiar with the periodic function. So, now what is a L periodic function? I take a positive L. Now, we define a function f from r to r and we say that f is L periodic if the function f of x plus L equal to f of x for every x. That means, after the length L in suppose if I my L is 1. So, if I have a function like this from 1 to 2, then I will cut this and then I will paste it here. Every one interval, this is going to be repeated. You just cut the 0 1 and put it between 2 and 3. So, this is what is the periodic function and if the here my L, we are taking it to be L is equal to 1. So, that is what means the periodic function. So, for example, you can take f of x is equal to sin 2 pi x L. Now, then f of x plus L, this is equal to sin 2 pi x plus L divided by L, which is equal to sin 2 pi x by L plus 2 pi L by L, which is 2 pi. Now, we know that sin 2 pi plus theta is equal to sin theta. So, this is sin 2 pi x by L, which is nothing but f of x. Similarly, cos 2 pi x by L is L periodic function. Now, for a general thing, what we will see is that now you take, we are do doing it f is a function from r to r. Now, I take a x in r. Now, our L is fixed. Now, we can find a n such that x is going to be in this interval n to n plus 1. So, there will be some n in which it is going to lie. So, I define f of x is equal to x minus of n l. That means, basically now I am defining for all practical purposes that 
f is from 0 to n l, 0 to l. So, now f of x plus l, this is going to be x plus l minus of n l, which is equal to x minus n minus of 1 l. Now, if, so now if x is lying between n l to n plus 1 l, then x plus l is going to lie n plus 1 l to n plus 2 l. Now, f of x plus l, this is equal to x plus l minus n plus 1 l, which is equal to x minus of n l, this is nothing but f of x. Therefore, this is a l periodic function. So, now given a function, how we are going to extend that to get the l periodic function. Now, suppose I have a function which is defined on 0 to l. So, like pictorially we are saying that how to get the l periodic function on the throughout uh, which is defined throughout r that whatever the picture of the g in 0 to l, we just got that picture and post paste it at l to 2 l, then 2 l to 3 l minus l to 0 minus 2 l to minus l like this, what we are going to get is a l periodic function. So, we can x that means, uh, we can extend g to a l periodic function as follows. We just define, now g is only defined here from 0 to l. Now, if our x is somewhere here, how we are going to extend this? Just like in the previous example, what we have done that if we have a x wherever it is, there will exist a n such that x is going to lie in this interval. So, now you define a new function f of x, which is equal to g of x minus of n l, if x is lying between here. Now, this f is now defined throughout r and then if I take f of x plus l, then easily like the last time what we compute, we are going to get that f of x plus l is equal to f of x. Okay, so, let us see some concrete example. So, now I take g of x is equal to 1 if x is between 0 to 1 half and this is 1 and it is only defined on 0 to 1. Now, we want to extend this function g to whole of r such that the extended function is going to be one periodic, that is what is our goal. So, now what we do is that this is, this is 1, this is half, then this is 3 by 2, this is 2, like this, this is 5 by 2, like this we extend. So, cut this paste here, paste here, paste here. So, this is this extended function is going to be one periodic function and which is defined on whole of r. Similarly, suppose I have a function here and suppose this is minus one half, this is one half, this triangle function, then how what how does the extended function will look like? this is what it is going to look like. The copies of the triangles are being pasted. So, now let us be, uh, it, when we are extending the function from an interval, then interval plays a major role. Now, let us see, so, suppose I have a function which is defined from minus pi to pi f of x is equal to x and we need I want to compare with that 
the function which is f of x equal to x, but on 0 to 2 pi. You see from here if I am shifting by 2 pi, I am not going to get 0 to 2 pi, because I will get pi to 3 pi. So, how does this function look like? Suppose, if I am taking the first one f of x equal to x from minus pi to pi, then this is this is the graph of the function. So, now I will cut and paste it from pi to 3 pi, I will cut and paste it from minus 3 pi to minus pi. So, this is going to look like this, this periodic extension. On the other hand, if I look at this function, so from this is 0 to 2 pi, this is x. Now, I am cutting it from 0 to 2 pi and putting it from 2 pi to 4 pi. As you can see that this function and this function is different. So, it is very, very important to determine when we are talking about the extension of the function from an interval. So, this interval plays a major role. So, now this periodic function is what? I mean intuitively you see that I mean it is defined on an interval. So, just think that we are uh, kind of if we bend the interval, then uh, the two end point if we join, if we merge the two end point, then what we are going to get is a circle. So, now it is natural that if I have a L periodic function, then I can think of that function as a function on the circle whose circumference is L. So, how do I write this? We will identify any L periodic function f on R with a corresponding function capital F defined on the circle T L. T L is nothing but where the circumference is L and I am doing it the center at the origin, where f of x is equal to the cap sum. Now, f is defined over here. So, this is L by 2 pi and this is nothing but the 2 pi i x by L. This is the argument part and this is the radius. Okay. So, a function defined on 0 L is continuous, we will say a periodic function defined on 0 L is continuous. If it is continuous at every point of 0 L, so an L periodic function f is continuous on T L, if it is continuous and f of 0 is equal to f of L because we are identifying 0 and L point. Therefore, f of 0 is has to be equal to f of L, then we say that it is continuous on this entire circle. Okay. A function 0 L to C is said to be piecewise continuous, that if it has finitely many discontinuities. So, this is a picture of the piecewise continuous function. You can see that this at this point it has a discontinuity, this point it has a discontinuity, at this point it has a discontinuity and then if I take the suppose this is my L, then you cut and paste like this. So, now it has finitely many discontinuity. So, now we can talk about the integration of the L periodic function. It essentially what I need to do is that I need to integrate uh, from 0 to L f of x dx. Now, suppose I have a periodic function intuitively let us try to see 0 to L. So, now I have this function. So, now periodic is going to be a copy of this, this is 2 L like this. So, natural thing is that the integration is nothing but the area under the curve. So, intuitively as you can see that suppose I start at this and I take a length of L, then whatever I am missing out from this is been 
incorporated here in this interval. So, in every interval of length L, then what we are kind of guessing that the area of the curve in that particular in integral is going to be the same if we are dealing with the L periodic function. And that is what it means to say mathematically is that integral a to a plus L. Now, you can see the suppose here is a, here is a plus L. Now, now if I have b here, this is b plus L, then a to a plus L f of x dx is equal to integral b to b plus L f of x dx for all a b in R. The which essentially it is saying that in any fixed length interval of length L you take and you compute the area that is going to be same, it is irrespective of the position where you were taking choosing your integral. So, the uh, proof most of you might have seen this. So, let us just recall it quickly. Now, if I left hand side, I write a to a plus L f of x dx, which I will do that this is 0 to L f. So, now I have uh, a to a plus L. Now, I will take this is 0 to L. Now, f is defined everywhere. So, 0 to L f of x dx. Now, plus I add L to a plus L. This in now, I want to get back this integral because this is a to a plus l. So, I need to subtract from 0 to a this part I need to subtract. Therefore, this is going to give me the a to a plus l. Now, this integral is 0 to l. Now, if I make a change of variable f of x plus l 0 to a f of then here f x plus l means this is 0, this is a and here I have minus 0 to a. So, this gets cancelled. I will get that this integral is equal to 0 to l f of x minus of f a and that essentially is equal to 0 to l f of x dx. Similarly, I can show that b to b plus l f of x dx is again 0 to l f of x dx. Therefore, it really does not matter where you are choosing your in interval. What it matters is that if you have a l periodic function, you have every uh, freedom to choose your interval. Thank you.